Welcome to the Startup Grind. I, and you may sit again. <laughs> okay, I, I guess I have to practice that more. <laughs> okay. Well, at least we we, we all got up, got up and yeah, some some exercise is good. Okay, um, I'm actually gonna let you introduce yourself, and um, we're gonna start with Bernadette Butler, the co-founder and CEO of Storytap. Oh yeah, I have a second microphone. What else would you like to add? Uh, yeah, whatever you would like to share. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for coming out. This is uh, an amazing uh, topic. I'm excited to talk about my experience. So I'm Bernadette, named twin over there. I never meet another Bernadette. This is so amazing. Totally. It's amazing. Um, so my company is called StoryTap. Uh, StoryTap is a DIY video solution for marketers where we help them collect very specific video stories from anywhere in the world like video product reviews, um, video testimonials, any kind of story. Um, we give them all the bells and whistles to do that and make them look like rock stars in their companies. So that is, that's me. Anything else? We will get to the other okay. things later. Oh, no. Thank you. Mariam. Hello everyone and thanks to Phil for inviting us and having us here. Um, I am first time technical female CEO of a tech AI company. So you know, it's, it's difficult to be first time CEO, tech CEO and female CEO and it's going to be fun having all of them three together. Um, so I am by training, I'm a computer um, science PhD. My training was in uh, computer vision, and I had also training in dermatology. I had a scholarship from um, Canadian government that was a very good opportunity to learn about different problems that computer scientists could, could actually uh, address and solve. So I started a company after my PhD and postdoc research at BC Cancer Agency and UBC Dermatology. Uh, and now we have customers from 27 countries. Uh, we have key um, lead centers, research for skin cancer and also hospitals uh, around the world. And the team is growing, the company is growing, and it's so exciting to be part of a company that delivers value and makes a difference. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. And finally, Ali. <laughs> thank you, Ralph. So very excited to be here and as Ralph said, I'll be um, going through a discussion with these amazing founders after. So I'm uh, speaking I'm on behalf of the CEO and founder of Women in Tech World. And Women in Tech World is a grassroots organization that is based on and really dedicated to creating actionable steps to support and advance women in tech. And so my background is five years within the fintech space, building data teams, overseeing operations, and working with institutional clients and e-commerce companies like Google, PayPal, and Amazon. And really, with Women in Tech World, have bridged that gap between the data side and uh, supporting and building confidence in, in women to get them uh, into roles within the tech space. So uh, understanding that there is a low participation of women within tech and how can we across Canada really understand on a research on the research side what where are the gaps? So there's lack of research in Canada in on women in technology. A lot of times we're referring to the states in the last StatsCan report was from 2011. So in uh, the fall of 2017, Women in Tech World went across the country and spoke with thousands, over 1,500 women and men to really dive deep into the problem and from a qualitative research perspective and spoke with communities uh, in 28 locations. So with that, I'll pass it over. Thanks, Ralph, for having me here. Thank you, Ali. All right, just to get a quick um, uh, opinion about the who's in the audience um, so who's in who's part of marketing marketing team who works in marketing Girls. great yeah there you go so what Bernadette yes, um, yes Ralph <laughs> sorry it's actually Raph Raph sorry yeah, yes Raph that, that, that's all right um, <laughs> What, what do you see? What are the, the, the common trends right now in, in marketing? And, I mean, obviously, you work on the video side. Yeah. What do you think uh, are most companies right now um, struggling with to market their product? 
I think the number one struggle in marketing right now is brand trust. There's a, epide a epidemic happening across every industry that, you know, things are being leaked. Look at Volkswagen, look, I mean, the list is long, even now profits have been caught doing things they should not be doing. And so as, uh, you know, as, as a society, we are lacking that trust in these massive brands and even even smaller brands. So marketers have to work really hard to build that brand trust. And Edelman's puts out, Edelman's a PR firm, uh, and they put out a brand trust barometer every year. And it is shocking how low people uh, have faith in these in these brands where they once, you know, our parents' generation would turn on the TV and go, you know, I don't know what's a product back then, but like Dove soap, well, they're amazing. Just you know, they would just believe it because they saw it, and it was a beautiful actress, and she she talked about the product in a poetic way because it was all scripted. And then they would go to the stores and buy that product. And now we have so many resources. We have, you know, all of all of us have a device in our pocket where we can research anything, and we're onto them. And so authenticity counters brand trust and that's that's our sweet sweet spot of course is authenticity but brands need to do a better job at being authentic and that is the only way they can combat uh brand trust you know i'm a 20-year veteran in advertising i've been pumping out ads forever i you know at three years old i knew i wanted to make ads i wanted to make funny ads i have two ads on the world's funniest reel I've focused on it my entire life, um, but the reality is it's really damn hard to do hilarious advertising. And when you think about what a marketer's job is, is to build awareness. Um, you know, when you look at the ad landscape, there are really three options today. You either are hilarious, let's hope, and that's really hard to do next to impossible. Even the ads I did, it was a calamity of errors of how it actually turned out. Like I couldn't recreate it if I tried, a lot of luck. Um, or you're educational, or you're real. People want to hear real people telling real stories, and that's what's moving the needle for, for marketers. So I would say, in terms of messaging, authenticity, in terms of content type, video. And I didn't invent it, but video did kill the radio star, so, you know. Yeah, so I heard that um, these days, 50% of your success depends on telling a story. Would you say that's accurate? Oh, I would say it's so much more. I mean, I think, you know, if you look at the great Steve Jobs, he, he like to coin him, not to be cliche, but the most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. And if all of you, uh, you know, your founders starting companies, your biggest asset you have going for you is to tell your story and tell it well. And, you know, constantly talk about your story, get your story critiqued. Every single word that comes out of your mouth to tell your story is important. Um, and that would be the one advice I would have, but I think storytelling is incredibly important on all, on all fronts. And what are the most common mistakes um, startups are making right now that you see? What are people are not thinking about when they, when they launch their product, maybe? Well, I, you know, it's tough. Like, I'm a marketer, and it, you know, the value prop, nailing your value prop is really tough, and I think a mistake that I see is um, people having, you know, a, a really complex, long-winded value prop. Like, long-windedness is your enemy. Like, if you can't spit it out in a sentence, um, work harder, try harder, get other people to give you feedback. I think a common mistake is, and I'm going to use this word. I'm going to say, you, we all do it. We just barf. We just show up like, whoa, and it's like, I don't even hear what you're saying to me. And and that if you continue to vomit what you do on everything, no one's hearing it. So in advertising, we'd, we'd have this this phrase of if you want to get a message across the table, think of it like a ping pong uh, game. You're going to hit, when you hit 10 balls across the table, someone's only going to hit one back. And that's the same with your messaging. So when you think through your messaging hierarchy, you know, you've got to n nail your value prop in one sentence. And I see a lot of, a lot of clutter, a lot of, I've got to really find like, what do you do? Oh, you know, I've got to hunt. And if I have to hunt, I'm going to give you a little limited amount of time. And an average person may just pass in, entirely. So who here ha thinks that he, he or she has nailed his value proposition and his pitch, his or her pitch? 
No one. It's tough. And you can reinvent it all the time. There's 40 customers for you. You can reinvent it all the time. Like, yeah, like, I mean, I, I, my, my last professional gig was with Bell and I did national communications. And, you know, the one thing I think is like, terrible is when you hang on to the same value prop forever people don't care it's not you also also have to be creative and inventive and rethink it and like be be uh current you know no offense but bell is better it's old it's time to reinvent it but that was so, my two cents so you started story in 2014 i incorporated so we took a year to build the tech um it took a year to really figure it out we actually started the technology in the b2c space and our focus was actually capturing um, life stories. So it was interesting when I talked when I heard um, this lovely lady. I don't know her name, but about the national defense, about life stories, because it's it was a big passion for me at the time. I was in marketing, but I lost at the time in advertising. No authenticity pulls. Had this vision for this video platform, but then started. I lost my dad. I lost grandparents, and I was like, man, our life stories are going. And I just I wanted to build tech to support that and um but at the same time i'm a marketer and i was too early with that and my friends were like can we use what you built for our like marketing friends for what we do and it really kind of forced a pivot so so how was that stage for you um you were were you still at bell at that point no 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 i'd, I'd left bell um i had two children i started this business when my daughter was four months old don't do that. Not a smart thing to do at all. I had a, a two-year-old at home and a four-month-old, and I told my because I was off on mat leave for a while, and I told my husband because I think of the loss of the family and the original vision was where we are today, which is odd. But you know, life shows up and kind of it drives a passion. And, and it's I actually started with Spring because I was impact-based and felt so passionate. And Keith Apple over there was phenomenal with us. Um, and uh, so started at four months old, literally on my second VC meeting, forgot to feed my child and had to um, uh, breastfeed in front of uh, investors. Also, don't encourage that. Don't do that. How, how did that go? Um, it was embarrassing for me at the time. Now I feel like, like I think um, Dana said, she goes, you're a badass. I'm like, yeah, now I feel like a badass. But at the time, I felt like I had everything on the line and I had forgotten to feed my child. And so my sister, who had my baby four months old, was circling the block. And I heard this screaming child in like this open concept, really intimidating place. And I'm like, oh God, that's not mine, is it? I'm like, and on slide six, we'll find my financial forecast. And I, all women know what happens when they hear their baby crying. And so it got really embarrassing really fast. So we put on, you know, a little business and um, and my sister was crying, the baby's crying, everyone's looking at me and I just kind of, you know, started nursing her and I said, do you mind if I keep going? And I think everybody was so shocked. They're like, yeah, please do. And so I kept going and my sister died in the corner of the room. She was so embarrassed. And um, afterwards, <laughs> I would just like, get me a glass of wine stat. <laughs> and, uh, but, but you know what's wonderful about that situation? I had, I had lunch with that lead investor um, on Tuesday. So it's so been- So you secured the deal? No, they, uh, I didn't know what I didn't know. They were a series A investor and I had an idea. So for all of you that know investment, it's like totally not, uh, would never invest in a million years, but it was an experience. And what I'm, I guess, kind of proud to talk about now. So how, how did then the investment round go for you from from then on? What, how, how challenging was it for you to, to raise uh, funds here and get StoryTap going? So this is gonna, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a different cat. So I wanted to start a business and I think like a lot of women, we kind of go, okay, we're gonna do this and bam, like we're just gonna do it. So like the third person I had coffee with and I shared my vision, he was like, yeah, I like it. And then that night he's like, okay, I'll cut you a check for 100 grand. I'm like, great, oh, this is easy. What is everyone complaining about? And then fast forward, because I, you know, that was my first check that enabled me to build my MVP product and hire people, find a co-founder. And I just thought, oh, this isn't hard, like what? Uh, what are people, it's a rumor, it lies. And, uh, quickly got into reality is we built this uh, storytelling platform and we were out in market. We were at spring at the time 
and credit to Keith, we had a different name at the time and Keith Ippel at the time was like, you should really consider a name with the word story in it. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, What was yeah, your Keith. name before? I'm not telling. <laughs> so, Chin, Chin, what was the name? He doesn't know. It was before Chin. There's no rats in the audience, we're good. <laughs> so, um, so anyways, when we, when we actually uh, had the, so we started running out of money and because we were too early the whole, whole business model was backed on marketing, my jam, but hey, check it out, you need a lot of money to do a really good job to build awareness around a new product. Didn't anticipate that as well as I could have. Started to run out of money and went, okay, we're just gonna raise, we're just gonna raise more money, but we didn't have enough traction. So um, then I went, oh, this is hard. Like, I get it now, but you know, kind of got to the altar with a lead investor um who were out of toronto they flew to vancouver my co-founder and i were kind of high-fiving like yeah we're doing this this is great we're, this is awesome and they flew to they flew to vancouver to tell us that they were going to pass and i'm like you guys are like evil or awesome i just i couldn't i don't know so um it was a challenge and so we had to put on our big girl big boy pants and pivot but um, we kind of secretly, I think, want, we were hanging on to this impact idea that was so amazing, but I, we were just too early. And again, it was um, ensuring that uh, our parents' generation could record a life story. The one flag I had is my own mother didn't do the life story. I'm like, come on, mom, can you support me here? She's like, I'm just fat right now. And I just, I'm like, oh my gosh, like what's happening? <laughs> So, you know, everything happens for a reason and I really do believe in, you know, lines, not dots and, um, and that massive, you know, jigsaw puzzle in life. And thank goodness we built the tech for that demographic because fast forward when we pivoted into a full on marketing space, it is so easy to use because we built it watching the 80 year olds press buttons like of course it's going to be easy it had to be in order for them to record a life story so if we hadn't started there i guarantee you the product we have today wouldn't be as amazing as what it is so i am grateful for that journey and so fast forward story tap so this part gets a little ugly my co-founder um, was really uh, so uh, impact based and he is phenomenal and he didn't wasn't as excited about the pivot so he decided he's like I might leave and I'm like okay you can leave okay and I was, I was dying inside I'm like okay this is just all gonna work out and another thing which is great about a lot of entrepreneurs is we're all very positive or you're not gonna be here because this is hard and so you've got to be positive so like the positivity inside of me like yeah, I can sit here and cry, but I'm gonna be like, you know what, forget about it. We're gonna solve this. This is a, a minor bump in the road. Three months later, he came back. I got to renegotiate our deal, it all worked out. So he's back. Um, and so what we started to do is, uh, I had to learn how to sell. I, I'm a marketer. Marketers are allergic to salespeople, like really highly allergic. Um, I had a fantastic mentor who said, no, no, you actually have to figure out like take a Claritin and figure this out because you're the CEO now. So I, I um, met with these two amazing guys who taught me how to sell and I now am a marketer. I can sell and do marketing. I did not invent that term, please use it. It's fantastic to say out loud, marketer. So, um, so then I started to sell and I started to figure out, oh wow, this isn't like an, a car salesman throw you in, like it wasn't that slimy thing that I kind of had in my head and other salespeople I had worked with that was kind of permeating my thoughts about what sales was. It was a conversation. And when, you know, our tech was so fantastic and I would meet with marketers who were like me and we'd have a conversation and they'd be like, yeah, that feels great, let's do it. I'm like, well, again, this is so easy, like what's happening? So we bootstrapped, we decided not to raise and we just, uh, it was, um, you know, we, whatever that saying is, you kill what you eat, which is terrible, but like, you know, like we bootstrapped, so you know what that means. So we bootstrapped for a year and then the tail end of that year, so this was last year, was our first year of real true sales in this, in this space, we decided to invest and make it a DIY platform and really turn on the SaaS. We knew that we had a product, we knew our customers loved us, we were checking all the boxes, we just had to finesse this like silky smooth um, SaaS model and at the same time Techstars called us and um, they, had, they had seen our platform at Vancouver Startup Weekend 
and um, asked us to apply kind of behind closed doors after the applications had closed. And like idiots, we were unsure. Techstars is amazing PS, so I don't know why I was unsure, but I was like, oh, I'm not sure. And so we decided to go for it, and uh, it, it's been phenomenal. We just actually finished that program, and so it's been nothing but growth and excitement from here on. Congratulations. Do you want to say a few more, more words about Techstars? Like, how, how, do you, how do you usually get involved? Yeah, Techstars, so um, I, I know there's other accelerator programs, but Techstars is a, is a global accelerator uh, program. Um, they've got lots of different programs. The program I um, was lucky enough to be accepted into is called Techstars Anywhere. So usually with Techstars, you move wherever you are, if you live in the city, but you generally move and, and be in that space for you know, a period of uh, just over three months. Um, they do invest in your company, so they are invested in you. It is a you know a lengthy selection process, um, but then it's a grind. And I remember my managing director said to me, "He's like, you are gonna find your sixth gear." And I'm like, "Dude, I'm a mom. I live in the sixth gear. Check it out. I wasn't. Uh, there is another gear. I, like I, I shocked myself. I shocked myself. My husband is still shocked. He's very gray, <laughs> but." Um, so yeah, so it's been a phenomenal thing. So you, they, you get a series of mentorships and they've got a crazy uh, international network. Um, I have nothing but wonderful things to say about Techstars. Um, if anybody wants to learn more about it after this, please uh, talk to me. I'm happy to share more about them. How is your husband feeling about all your uh, endeavors? How is he supporting you? <laughs> well, right now he's happy because the kids are in bed. Um, <laughs> you know, he... He was really great. He was great in the beginning, fantastic, very supportive. When things got really, really tough, like financially tough, like are we gonna sell the house tough? Um, that's when he was uh, a little less excited about this path because I had left a very high paying, you know, advertising marketing gig. Um, uh, but he's always, he's always been my rock and he's really supportive. And, um, you know, I think, it, thank goodness because you question yourself enough anyways, but you know, you need someone and of course he's gonna be like, you, a lot of times with women, the issue for us anyways, we have, we have two children, so the cost of me figuring out how to do a startup wasn't just me not taking a salary, it was daycare, which is $2,000 a month. And so we're out of two, because I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not home with the kids, so mom guilt plus daycare plus I don't know what the hell I'm doing. This is exciting. I'm going to be a unicorn. Um, it, you know, but he he's been in my corner. You know, a few waffly moments, but he's he wears the story tap T-shirt proudly. Mariam, how how are you handling this? Your your uh, imagine your husband. This is the amazing story here. I'm like, oh my god, you are very good at marketing for sure. Your husband <laughs> is uh, is co-founder of Meta Optima. Yes, right? but you are the CEO. You are yes. the are you the also the boss at home? Um, honestly, we have a very flat structure in the company. No matter like where you are, so we have like management, which is like management. It's not just like one here, one here. And also, I believe in uh, I be I believe in a flat structure for companies when you're building your company because all of your team members are important as you. So for me, it's not like I'm the boss or he's the boss. Uh, I have technical background, so I'm like co-CTO, co-CEO, and he's helping with so many things in business, and I believe he's a co-CEO, co-CTO as well. Um, so that's actually the level of support I really have from Majid. And he's my best friend, first, my husband, my partner, and actually my partner crying for about 16 years. So we have a our investors told me we have a bulletproof love, which means <laughs> I didn't know what it is, but they told me it's a red flag when you see, um, you know, couple founders and you don't want to invest in them. But they told me, no, Marina, we were right. You have bulletproof love. So, yeah. It's great. You got really lucky there. <laughs> uh, so, and who came up with the idea for Meta Optima? Um, so basically it started from my PhD program. Um, I, my PhD was in computing science uh, in medical image analysis, computer vision. And I had a scholarship from um, the government for, uh, it was a CIHR program, um, skin research training program at UBC Dermatology. So I was working on skin cancer images, working with dermatologists on finding skin cancer. And he was in the next 
lab, he was doing machine learning and natural language processing. And whenever I needed him, I was like, Majid, can you come here? Like, how we should do this? And we published papers together. Um, so he was basically part of my even like research background. So organically, again, it happened to be, okay, I'm gonna do this. There's a long story behind it, how I started with this, you know, the business and when was the moment I said, okay, I'm gonna do this myself. There's a long story. I'm gonna write a book about it. <laughs> Watch for it. When we have a unicorn, yeah. honestly. <laughs> the, yeah, no. So Yam was actually one of our first team members, and uh, he knows we have a folder in our company shared folder called "Them Adopt My Story." Yes, and all our team members keep saving photos of that folder for the book. We all know it's gonna happen. So it's called "Them Adopt My Story." Um, so yeah, actually, when we decided to start this, um, Majid was like, oh no, I don't think we should work together. It's too much. <laughs> there is no work-life balance, I know, in that case. And, but, I, um, but he said that I'm very serious. And I was talking to my friend from Silicon Valley you know, on the phone about marketing, about manufacturing, about, okay, what we're gonna do, prototypes, and he was like, Mariam, are you serious? I was like, yes, I am serious. And then I convinced him to join me. He could easily go for, you know, very good salary in Silicon Valley. I, he actually had job offers, and I convinced him to stay and we do it together. And I think it's the only way for me that I can work 18 hours a day because we are together. No one is complaining. And we don't have kids, so my mom keeps reminding me, I was like, no mom, I have 26 in the office. <laughs> you know? And I love actually my, my life. So I, I, I live every moment of it. I'm not missing anything. It's, again, maybe just my story, maybe different for different um, people, but I think you should find what keeps you happy and gives you motivation and, you know, you can work. And for me, it's good that I have my partner and co-founder to work together, to live together. It's all work-work balance. <laughs> 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 all work-work, no matter where we are. How, how was it then for a third team member or a fourth team member to get on board? Did they think it was weird that you were in, in, in a, par a partnership and um, uh, starting Investors, you mean? Or? No, like your, your, your first hires or next team, your first team members. Um, See, my husband's coming, so yeah. I'm gonna reject that, so I'm gonna <laughs> um, No, actually I didn't have that problem. Um, so for us, we started, um, so I think it was lucky to have access to the talent pool from SFU, from UBC, uh, and also I was at SFU, I had, a, I had an academic position there. So we had amazing co-op students who started with us, stayed in our company, they started their own successful businesses, Jan has my support 100% in all his steps and because I think it's like giving back really. Like for me, it's like I had a lot of support from the community. I think I believe in social capital much more than financial capital when you're starting your business. Because if you're a student, no one is charging you for giving you advice. Like they see you in a position that you have this drive and passion and you know what you do, but you need a lot of support to make big things happen and they're here to support you. So in our first hires, I didn't have that challenge of, but definitely when we were presenting to investors, I learned to have that disclosure even when they send us an email. I was like, just to let you know, my co-founder is my husband. If this is gonna be a problem for you, we shouldn't meet. <laughs> and like, okay, thank you, Maya, for sharing that with us, let's talk. <laughs> so yeah. So did you get some rejections because of that? I don't know if it was because of that or not, but for us, the case was, again, I didn't, like, we had three rounds of financing before this round that we are closing now. It wasn't difficult. Um, it was difficult in Canada, but we were lucky to have a lot of interest from other countries. Our first investor came from Europe. The same group, basically, we had from Europe, we had from Australia, we had from the city, and also Canadian local investors. So I thought, okay, it, it is, it, it's a process, honestly. It's like a lot of legal paperwork. You need to be on top of everything and you have no idea, you know, what is exit strategy. Like, I Googled what is exit strategy, like in the first, <laughs> honestly, I had no idea what it is. Like, they were asking technical questions, financial questions, and as a computer scientist, you have no idea about, like, the business world, right? Um, so, but we had oversubscription all three rounds. Um, I rejected the big, big amount in the third round. That was a difficult decision. We just we rejected an offer in July for our Series A. It was a big decision. Why? But I just knew that because I think it was um, 
too much too strategic for us. So for example, if you are if, if you are building a company that you believe is a global play, you don't want to be known as this guy's company very early because you will lose the competition, right? For example, if I take investment from one of the big players, I have already lost their competition market, which is a huge market, right? <laughs> so for us, we want to have in, uh, we want to have inclusive team of investors who come provide a strategic advice and help, but not too close and too big um, to one of them. So, but you know, it doesn't mean that we won't work together. It doesn't mean they won't invest, you know, in this round or in future rounds. But it was just too big to accept from one. Is that something you learned by experience? Um, yes, yes, I learned by. Basically, we had. Okay, when I was talking to one of our potential clients, they were upset that we had investment from an, from their competition, and it was a small investment. I was like, wow. I didn't know that it was my first time, right? But then I learned that and. I try to be mindful about my decisions for building a healthy, sustainable, scalable business. Because you, you always have so many challenges that you see, okay, I have to fix this, I have to solve this, but there's a lot coming. So I think it's good. It's difficult, definitely difficult. I, I was questioned a lot, why you reject this investment? You know how difficult it is to raise funds and you, you won't find anyone to invest in your company with the valuation that you want, and you should have accepted that. But I was like, no, I don't think that was a healthy decision for this business, because I think we have a bigger vision. And if I believe in that, you know, checkbox unicorn that I'm going there, I should make sure I set the stage to get there. You don't want to sell your company too early. You don't want to make decisions. I think we shouldn't be short-sighted if we have that big vision. Um, and I know it's difficult. It's very difficult, like very difficult. Um, but that's a difference, right? So can, can you share a little bit more about details about your technology because I think it's super exciting. And also, when, when did you figure out that you had this vision of becoming huge? Okay. And maybe a Canadian unicorn. <laughs> um, so about the technology, it again is about building um, an AI engine, artificial intelligence engine for dermatology, which means supporting patients and care providers for early diagnosis of skin disease and monitoring and treatment decisions. So ideally, one sentence for our product is we have, we want to unlock technology to help physicians to detect and treat skin cancers better. Okay, this is a sentence. Okay. How, how was it? How was it? Yeah, okay. okay, thank you. I got A plus. Um, so yeah, this is so that the technology, the concept is simple, but when it comes to implementation of AI in this industry, which is under digitized, it's you know the latest industry to adopt innovation. You have a difficult job. Um, so for us, um, the key was how we incorporate artificial intelligence in the air everyday use of the platform for physicians and they don't reject it, they don't reject it, they don't see AI replacing them, they don't see it as a black box that will tell this is cancer or not. And I communicate this very, very clearly with them. Look, I have worked with you to learn how to solve this problem and I know what are your problems. I want to solve your problems. I don't want to replace you. So this was the message and I think it was well received. So that's why we had, uh, we had a very good traction for an innovation in an innovative market. Two things, very difficult. You can have innovation, but like market that everyone knows what is the product, or you can have a product in innovative market, like, okay, difficult. But if you have innovation in innovative market, it's very tough. Because no one knows what will do, no one knows how to use it. They've never seen one, right? Um, so in our technology, very simple. For example, you can take you, I mean, as, as a physician at this stage, we have tools for patients as well, but the AI piece is for physicians. You can take a photo of a skin disease. We have a little device, a digital microscope, dermoscope for skin exams. Um, our derm engine platform can match that with similar cases from the database with pattern matching and machine learning. It can find similar cases and it can show you differential diagnoses for those cases that you have already pathology reports, it's confirmed biopsy results, you have outcome what worked for the patient. 
And ideally, but this is actually where we are going at this stage, that you can match patients. Now, if we have genomic information, if you have RNA, DNA information, I should be able to see if this treatment works for patients like me. I shouldn't be surprised with the side effects. Doctors shouldn't guess if it's gonna work for me or not. Um, unfortunately, when it comes to melanoma, which is one of the most deadly forms of cancer and very aggressive, there are not actually many effective treatments. And we need the technology to help our patients and also to help our physicians. Honestly, they are doing it difficult. It's a very difficult job. I've seen oncodermatologists and I'm like, this is very difficult. This is a difficult life to lead because you're always talking to patients who have no hope if the treatment will work. But you want to show them, no, this is actually the best we can do and look at the results. It worked for 100 patients similar to you. You should keep fighting. This is a different play, I think, and it's very rewarding when you see the impact of what you do in like real life of patients and physicians. And I think if you have such motivation, it's gonna keep giving you energy to work harder and harder. And I, I believe in our team, we always say our product is built with love and by smart people, so it is gonna just, work. <laughs> just wanna see uh, anyone here in the audience working in, in the health industry? Not really. So, but but coders here, people with technical a, background. Yeah, a, AI, machine learning. Okay, your hands. Yeah. So, are you are you? Is your technology unique? Um, our technology is unique um, because I don't think it will stay unique because you know this is the trend. We can see applications of AI in different industries. Our technology is unique because we have developed and implemented with a different mindset. So I think we were, we are, and we were smart in designing our workflow, user experience, how we inject AI in the workflow for physicians without scaring them and making sure they accept it. So yes, it is unique if it is the first technology used by lead melanoma centers around the world. Yeah, great. And I, and I also hear out that there are still a lot of opportunities in this area, digital health uh, for entrepreneurs um, yes. to, to come up with some great ideas. So yeah. uh, hopefully some people get inspired here and, 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 and uh, there's still still a lot of uh, great things you can do in this area. And it's so it's so rewarding if you can actually save life of yeah, people. It is. Right? It is. And, yeah. yeah. Um, Ali, I, w I would like to come to you. Um, so, why did you start Women in Tech World? So, Women in Tech World, I it's it's really interesting actually. My I grew grew up uh, well. I was born on the North Shore and then grew up in Ontario and was working in the investment banking side and came here and started to work for a global identity verification tech company. So, I had been like throughout my life always focused on building confidence in young women. Um, as a young girl in grade eight, I was part of Girls on the Run, which was an awesome program of, you don't run away, which a lot of people think of when you say Girls on the Run, but um, it's actually just running. So you run after school and through that build confidence in different ways. And it's a technique to, to also build confidence through of one aspect, which was running. And so I continued to do that throughout my life in different forms, uh, future possibilities for kids. And then I came here and was uh, the ch chair for the Women in Leadership Foundation. And so I was also working for a large tech company here and focused on building our data side and noticed the we had few women in our tech company as well. And so it was an area where I saw needed change. And that, um, with Women in Leadership Foundation, we started Women in Tech Week and hosted two national weeks with that and have pivoted since then. So we were hosting professional development. So we had $50,000 worth in tech scholarships, Lighthouse Labs, um, Bernadette in the back working there, Brain Station, uh, Code Core provided scholarships for women to be able to go to their coding schools across the country, which was amazing. And then we also had award ceremonies for women looking at how they contributed across the country to the tech industry. 
And But with this also hosting, we had in seven cities across the country, 25 events and they were all sold out. But how I couldn't see the direct impact and that was, uh, and that's where just being in the space as well, understanding uh, and realizing the lack of research we pivoted Women in Tech World and are really focused on actionable steps to help and support Women in Tech. And that actionable steps piece first starts with our customer discovery phase and really talking to women in tech across the country. So we've spoken with uh, 2,000, over 2,000 women and men um, on what is helping women succeed, what is hindering them and recommendations and are launching a report in September. But with that also, hackathons in different cities to be able to, with the research, provide action from it. So we don't want it to be a report that just sits online, but working with different community partners as well, with UBC in their venture, um, like female and venture cohort, to be able to implement the research there. So what is the problem? And then maybe we can, we can open up the, the discussion. Um, so and then also um, open up the, the uh, open up questions for the audience as well. Yeah, so um, we are actually we collected it's qualitative research, so it's we have 145 hours of audio files as well as uh, over 2,000 idea books and different stories that we're going through. So we are still really diving deep into the research right now, um, but just from anecdotal and being a part of these community conversations, a big piece is societal change. So looking at paternity leave and as well as what are hiring processes that are in place that Miriam had talked about as well. She has 50%. And so those unconscious bias pieces. And how, how can we look at the society as well as on a personal level with these different systematic changes that need to happen over and will take time. How can we as women uh, build that confidence and speak up and have our voices heard? That's one of the big, big things as well is uh, all of us together working together instead of uh, competing. How can we raise each other up and having that conversation? There's a lot of evidence around from Harvard that has come out to say women's voices, it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman that's listening, uh, women's voices are generally not not heard as well as a man. So if a man is in the room, they, they will be heard over a woman. So it, if it's a woman colleague, either repeating something that you've already said or an, a male colleague doing the same, those are ways that we can help. Do you, do you have some numbers, for example, for us uh, on like how, how many uh, female-led companies are getting funded? Or yeah, so that, that was actually really interesting. When we went uh, and started this research, it, it, was, it was always qualitative based because we wanted it to be from a community perspective. Um, but last year, at the end of last year, there were some reports that accumulated a number of quantitative stats across the country. So in Canada in 2017, there's 5% of Canadian tech companies that are founded by women. And then across uh, all Canadian tech companies, there's 13% of women that uh, comprise of them. So there, it, the participation is quite low. Uh, and it is a pipeline issue as well, just seeing and hearing from the community conversations, even at a university level in our education system, there are wait lists for computer science classes. And that's, in, it's not even waiting a semester, it's waiting multiple semesters to get into these classes. And they have been accepted into the computer science program. So there's a number of people that are also being left behind even from there. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll yeah. open up the floor. And I just have, mm -hmm my questions on here, but uh, to, to start off, you both provided your stories on your companies, but to look at it from a uh, women's perspective and starting and considering to start a company, how, what are some challenges that you have, for better or for worse, challenge can be seen as both a good and bad thing, but what, how, what have you experienced within the tech industry? Lots of challenges. Um, but you know what, here's the thing. I think dudes also have the same challenges. Like, um, I think as a woman though, uh, one I mentioned is um, the trade-off if you do have children is that trade-off of, of daycare. For, for me personally, everything 
fell on my shoulders at home. You talked about, was my husband supportive? And I say yes, until first week of tech stars when I said, I will end you unless you do the laundry. Like, you know, he needed to step up at home because I couldn't perform at this level, uh, at the competitive level of tech stars and be this awesome home, home, um, home giver. So he did. It's really terrible laundry though, I won't lie. <laughs> terrible, uh, but he did. Um, but I think there's a lot of challenges. I know for me personally, uh, a challenge I had is I talk fast. A lot of women talk fast. We all hear fast and we talk fast. And when I first started circulating my round um, pre-pivot, I had female founders pull me inside and say, the men aren't gonna, actually in one angel investor in town who told me to talk with a deep voice and go home and talk like this to your children and see if they actually do what they say because I guarantee your kids aren't listening to you now and that you scream a lot at them. And I was offended and I was mad and I you know, said, oh, thank you for your feedback with that smile, right? Uh, but I hate to say it, there's some truth in that, damn it. Uh, but I do talk fast, and a lot of women talk fast. Um, I, my highest performing sales girl talks like a mile a minute. And so I think that's just women. We, I, I don't know what it is about our DNA, and if there's a scientist here, you are, you'll probably have some like, I don't know, but we need to talk slower. And I think that's going to help with getting heard better. And I've been consciously trying to do it, so I'm heard. Or maybe men have to think faster. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the solution is, but you know, I I've seen it where I've been. Um, I do pitch competitions and stuff where I'm pitching against men, and I I've saw I've seen a huge difference in the response from the room when I take a breath and I have that pregnant pause. That very important pregnant pause. And it's important. And it's something that's really, it doesn't come e as easily to a lot of women. And I think that is critical and it'll help you both in uh, selling, in pitching, and, and the rest. But um, uh, those are just names if you won't hog the rest. Probably a billion. <laughs> um, your answer was very interesting because I think it was similar to what I also discuss with Raph about um, the challenges when you're starting this, you'll face, it is difficult anyway. Doesn't matter what's your gender, it is difficult to build a successful business. It is more difficult for us because there is a history behind it. And you should not, you should, I did accept it, that I'm not gonna be able to change the whole history to say, okay, now there's no unfair judgment about us and I can start, I was like, no, there is. Just face it, smile, stay positive. And I said, you know what? Numbers will talk. I'm not sure it's gonna work. It was my attitude all the time. No matter what happens, I'm gonna do it. And then I also found that there will be so many things that you will notice and you will tell from the body language or you walk to a meeting and they are they keep talking to your co-founder. I was like, sorry, I'm the CEO. I'm the decision maker, by the way. He's my co-founder and he's my husband, but I will make the decision about the business side, right? But it's still, they keep talking to him. It's so offending. I call the head pat. Yeah, but then I was like, Mariam, no complaint. You knew this, right? And you have seen this, even like in some families, I've seen it, honestly. It's not just a startup or entrepreneurship or this is our everyday life. Come on, just get over it. Numbers will talk, you'll show. And of course, we have to be stronger. We have to be stronger. And I think when I talk to my, and I have had female um, successful entrepreneurs, I've seen so many of them, and I have seen unsuccessful you know, male friends and you know, uh, entrepreneurs. So it, at the end, it's your mindset. Because it's difficult. Like if it's maximum, maximum difficult, it gets a little bit more difficult, it doesn't matter that level, honestly. It doesn't matter. It's so hard. But if you want to do it, and if you just, you've decided this is gonna be, yay, fun ride, I'm gonna do it, then do it. I just mentioned 
on one thing. Um, and one thing I, I've really noticed is confidence. Like I'm a very confident person, but I am no match for the most confident man. And that's in respect to pitching your business, the projections where it's going to go and kind of that, the, the vision that is like so exciting and so amazing. And I think a little bit because I think myself and a lot of female founders that I know are really pragmatic, like they're maybe air on the side of conservative a little bit, but it's like I always under promise over deliver and that's how I've run my game forever. And in when you're fundraising, um, your job is to really excite the possibility of where your business is going. As much as you have that in you, it's almost like you'd feel like, you know, um, that you aren't being truthful in some respects. And I think that's just women. And I don't know why that is because, you know, where I've had it is incredibly exciting, but you should, you know, I've had some comparison stories. I'm like, you don't even have a product. And it's like, it, you know, but the, the confidence level, literally I was in a pitch meeting, pitching a female investor and I was up against another guy. It wasn't a competition, but we were both pitching. And I went first and she was, she's a marketer. She's my people. She's loving it. We've got traction. We've got customers. We've got testimonials. We've got, you know, uh, hotspot, innovative tech, all tick all the boxes. And then these amazing guys, three guys, and, and I'm watching them pitch. And she's doing the body, like she's leaning in and she's so interested. I'm like, oh my God. They are killing me on this. And they don't even have, they didn't have a product. They didn't have a customer. They were in a competitive space. Their only differentiation was brand. Brand, they were gonna brand it different. I was like, God damn, they did it. So I pulled them aside and I high five them. I'm like, I just learned something. Like, what'd you learn? I'm like, I just gotta be more like you guys. Like you guys just, you sold the vision, um, at, like where it could be, like really where it could be. And I think that's a job that we have to really work on. It is hard. Apples to apples, it is hard. You have to bring your A game and just really believe in your vision and talk about it and sell it. Not just like, oh, I hope we turn into a unicorn. Like you will be a unicorn and you will because you're a woman and we achieve things. We don't just say we will, we do. And that's why people should invest in us. So there, I'm done, okay. <laughs> No, but that, that's exactly it. When Miriam was talking as well, big round of applause. It's so true. It is that to be able to get a funding round and say no, you have to be confident in yourself and in your product and in your vision of where you want to go. And so to be able to do that, I think women sometimes get too mixed up in the perfectionist piece of it. And really, so looking at that, um, is what what we need to do and how can we look at bigger, better and be confident about that we can make it there and it doesn't have to be perfect, but we can do it. Right? And, and one thing I've learned through Techstars is you can do all your financial project projections and they're wrong. And when you meet with your investor, they'll say, I'd love to see your financial projections and they know they're wrong. So apples to apples, your projections are wrong. Where's your company going? It better be a big vision if you're starting, you wanna disrupt something, that's why you're doing it. That's why you're you're all in and 18 hours strong, right? That's why we do it, so. And if it's an idea, then they're believing in you, right? So my next question is really around that unconscious bias piece. And if you have experienced that from pitching or building your company and what, what that has looked like to you, how have you overcome it? Sure. Um, in my case, it wasn't just my gender that was a problem. I think it was also the fact that I had no experience and I was a tech CEO. So for someone, <coughs> I think that we should also understand the pattern, right? If you look at um, successful companies or 500 companies, um, there was a report that one of the organizations that I was, um, uh, they were interviewing me, they told me in the report that they had, in top of 500 companies, they were, there were more male CEOs named John and David than all female CEOs together. Okay. Okay, so look at the numbers, look at the pattern. I always try to be fair with understanding the other side of the table, no matter female or male investors sitting there. I think they look at numbers, they look at patterns, and there is this bias that they haven't seen enough, right? It's changing, 
So now we see, I saw a report, it was very actually interesting and I loved it, that was showing that there are, there was increase, there's a good increase in the number of successful female CEOs in AI businesses, technologies. So I was like, yay, it's happening. Because, you know, the, there are challenges um, and there has been in the history that we cannot change, but we should just face the um, reality and come up with addressing those when we are talking to potential investors. I think if they, sh they see that you are good at what you do and you have confidence and you have a good vision, of course they will win with you, right? And no matter if it's financing round or if it is government <coughs> grants or any type of support that you receive, I think it's very smart to show them return on investment, to keep reporting to them how you've done it. Like for example, we have support from MyTax, from NSERC. These are all programs available, right, for entrepreneurs and, and big companies. And also there are programs that actually, for example, IRAP that supports um, entrepreneurs building companies. In every single report, I show them we had $45,000 but well, we pay $78,000 in tax. Like, this is taxpayer money you are giving us. We should show the value that we create and how we return that investment in, in bigger value for our supporters, founders. I think this has been very helpful for me personally, and I would suggest you also do that if you are working with any funding agency, anything like regarding the government support, and also when it comes to investors, every round, you show them, look, you started at 20 cents, now it's 42 cents, now it's 90, and now it's like $2, you know? Mm -hmm. Numbers work. And it's actually, it, it speaks of you can deliver value, so um, again, it's a tough thing to do, and you are probably much better in your soft skills compared to your, um, you know, uh, main friends and entrepreneurs, I've seen that. I have seen you are very good at HR side, because I, don't know, I may be biased, I don't want to talk to everyone. My experience says that I believe in human relationship in the business, not just numbers. I believe our team is the core of success and no matter how good is your business in terms of numbers, they can make it great. Like they can build it, they can be with you. And I again, it, it comes to the personality and I think the capabilities that we have. We run, basically we manage fam our families, we care about them, and in my case, it was true, and I think it was well received by my team, our investors, and again, I, I think it's unfair to always talk about discrimination, because you, we also have supporters. Our investors, I think we have probably 30 or 40 percent of our investors are female <laughs> investors. Individuals, not necessarily VCs or big firms, but look, 60 percent are male. They are supporting us. It doesn't mean that they ignore what we do, but it means just it's more difficult. It's just, again, it's more difficult if you are in competing science program, competing with your you know, um, peers. Anyway, it is not just a business world, it's everyday life. Um, just wanna say, we probably have to wrap it up shortly, and I wanna leave some, some time it's for It's unconscious bias. <laughs> Uh, but, but do you I'll take two, two quick yeah, things. Yeah, sure. I think it's hard to nail unconscious bias because you don't know it's happening. Um, and I think there's some uh, tips and tricks. I think one thing that we all need to do, and I think, like, can you like be a unicorn, please? Because the more female unicorns, the more in trends, they're like, oh, dude, like, look at these last 10 women, we're all unicorn companies, trends patterns are gonna bet on us more. I think we have to be smarter. Sure, there's a bias. Do I, have I seen it in investor meetings? Yeah, but uh, is it uncomfortable? Does it make my co-founder mad? Yes, but I, I can't lose sleep on it. Next, and I think when you're running a fundraising, um, when you're running your fundraising, it is strategy, and you have to build your pipeline, and it is a numbers game, and you need to be strategic. And I think when you actually, like, I know for me personally. I take all the uh, VCs that don't have one female founder in the portfolio company, they're like my last to talk to. Cause I don't, you know, I'm time starved. And so I'm gonna go with those that have at least backed a company that has a female founder or a female in the C-suite. That just to me is common sense, just out of the gate, just hedging my bets. So being smarter, we need more female unicorns 
is it there? Sure, but like, is that gonna stop us? It shouldn't. Um, and I think we can just keep going and over to the audience now. Yeah, so many, sorry. There, I see so many female entrepreneurs in the audience. This is awesome. Uh, or who would actually def uh, have defined herself uh, as entrepreneur? Okay, founders, founder, founder in the room. Okay, a couple. Good, great, great. Okay, questions from the audience. This is oh. hi everybody. Um, I've just been thinking about stuff while you ladies have been talking. Um, I do follow the whole tech, social media, computer, cell phone companies, the big ones around the world, and I was thinking about how they are so male-dominated, of course, um, because that's where it all started, incubated up, up, up for the last 30 years. It's been very male-dominated. All of the main social media channels are owned and founded by males. Um, then you have Reddit and you have um, Spotify. All these are, are males. You also have some women in high positions, like Sheryl Sandberg at Facebook, and uh, is it Melissa Mayer at Yahoo? And then I'm trying to think of, what do you girls think will there be and when a female who is the owner and founder of a huge, huge tech or social media company? The only one that I can think of that was huge in tech was Theranos, and we all know what happened to that. Um, it went bust, the blood testing company. Anyway, just curious what you think. You know, I, I, I see those same stats, and I, again, I'm, I'm obnoxiously positive. I think there's opportunity, and absolutely everything you said is, is truth, uh, but it ain't over yet, and we need more women, we all need to encourage women too and when i meet young women who are you know in high school thank you for being here by the way what the number one thing i say is i say go hang out become a tech nerd or go hang out with them think of ideas throw 10 on the wall prove prove each one systematically that they will not work and you will find one that will work and you know one of my one of my mentors um who i don't know personally but one day i will is martha stewart not for her baking because i cannot bake but for her business savvy billionaire twice overnight and she wrote a book in jail props that basically gave you 10 steps to starting a business and it's so pragmatic it's so real and i think that you know this is an opportunity for women to grab the bull by the horns and i think as much as we can encourage are the junior women kind of um, as, as they collectively grow to immerse themselves into tech, be friends with people in tech, think of ideas, form those relationships and get at it. Just start. And I think a lot of these mega mogul unicorns started in garages when they were 19 and 20 and a lot of women are starting after they're having babies present company excluded. But I did and others did because we have time all of a sudden. Um, and so that needs to shift as well. But I think there's a lot of opportunity for us and uh, Somebody here needs to be a unicorn, so let's go, girls! <laughs> yes. Can I add something? Yes. Um, I think it's also important when you look at the, um, you know, so we have this infrastructure, we have a talent pool, and then we have successful entrepreneurs, you know, coming and building these companies. But if you look at back then, for example, when Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs or these guys started building these companies, what was the percentage of female students even in those classes? right like the percentage doesn't work the numbers don't work um, and if you have just few in one program how do you expect the ecosystem to give us more successful entrepreneurs but now with the increase in the percentage of you know um, women in computing science women in engineering we can see this is happening and I think that's important so I don't think we so I I, I wouldn't question the performance of our women engineers or computer scientists or entrepreneurs, I would question the percentage. And if you just look at the numbers, okay, we had like two in this class and like 42 male. Of course, the chance is very small, but this is changing and my numbers are promising for AI. So yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> and I also really believe that women think of problems differently. Um, 
and much differently than a man will and there's nothing against either or but there's an opportunity as you say with your business you've thought of addressing your problem differently you are a, a woman who thinks differently and you're problem solving differently than a man does we just think differently and hooray for that so wherever there is a male dominated xyz there should be the female counterpart thinking about it differently and let's see who wins just saying I, would, I just want to add on to the education on computer science and tech. That is, there's a situation happening right now in um, BC, I would say, and I don't know if that happened to Canada, but when you go to a company and you see the job description and they use the word like rock stars, like the pro culture, that's like the job description tend to toward more men. And that is happening right now with computer science classes in high school. So when they need more people in the course to keep the course alive, they want men. Cause so the curriculum basically changed to more game-based development. And when we change to that, the girls, they start to back up because that is not what they familiar with. And they saw so many people, like so many like peers out there that already live with the computer since day one. So that is like right now is happening. Yeah. Um, so actually, um, one of the programs that I was actively involved after my uh, PhD program was called Let's Talk Science and also um, Try Catch. So they, there are programs at SFU at UBC um, run by uh, students, grad, grad school students, uh, for high school students and elementary school. So the idea was to give them more insight about what's happening in our world, like when we are in grad school or when we are studying business. So I think one thing I have, I have experienced myself. I'm in a class with 38, 40, uh, you know, other students, and I'm maybe the only, you know, female student there. And then you're always, you see this domination, like everything, the games they like, social events, hangout, and you're uncomfortable in some situations, even like you don't want to be there, right? But at the end, you understand that you can solve different problems. And for me, I was not the best coder in the class. And I am not the best programmer. But I told one of my friends, and he didn't like it, that, you know what? You guys will work for a company, and you will have a boss. I'm going to be your boss. <laughs> because I know enough about tech, and I have good management skills. I don't have to be the best programmer, but we want management and executives from computing science programs, from engineering programs. Those are the skills you need if you're running a team. And that was a joke, actually, because he told me, why you win all these awards? Like, I'm a better programmer. I was like, you know what? It's not just about programming. There are so many other skills that you should have to succeed. And I was joking, you will have a boss, and I will be your boss. <laughs> <laughs> We're, sorry, we're running quite a bit. We're over time, sorry, my, my bad. Um, but are you guys still having fun? Yeah. All right. Or do you, do you want to break and then have like uh, these discussions in small groups and wrap it up here? You, or are you dying for, to ask? Who's dying to ask another question? Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you for uh, for a great uh, session. Uh, I have a question about self doubt. Like uh, women in general, they they self criticize themselves a lot, and I'm wondering if you guys have experienced that. Did that hold you back, and how you overcome it? Um, since you will have so many difficult days, you will make so many difficult decisions. Yes, you will have self doubt. I do have it every day. Everything I do, I'm like, what if? What if? Specifically, you are responsible for those decisions if it's against the stream, right? If you reject a big financing round, you're like, what if you know, something goes wrong? Like, what if, yes, you will have those. But I think what will help you at the end is really your determination, your persistence, and your hard work. That will say, I was like, for me, I've learned a word that was very helpful, whatever. I use it a lot. I was like, Whatever, we'll make it happen. Whatever, doesn't matter what you say. I'm just, and then that's, it's very important to know your areas of improvement. 
and understand and accept them. For me, I'm not good at number. I am good now. I was not good at financial state, you know, projections. I had no idea about those even technical terms. Of course, I was not confident in making those decisions. But then again, we are smart, like in building our team. I think women are better in, like I'm not shy when, it's, when it actually comes to ask for help. Not at all. I can go easily to a stranger and say, can you help me here? I think I don't know this part. Like, I just need to, to know more here. Again, I know areas of improvement for myself, and I just face it, and no one is perfect, right? No, and I've, I, I was fortunate to talk to a couple of very successful billionaires and entrepreneurs who built their businesses. They also have that problem. And one of them told me he cried, he was lonely CEO. I was like, really? I cannot believe it. I thought it's only me. I left one of the meetings. I left, I went to washroom, I cried, put my makeup, I come to up to the meeting. Because yes, you will have problems. You will see so many offensive comments maybe, like about your performance or things about your appearance and no one is giving the same comment to your you know, co-founder. And it will be difficult. I, I would say three things helped me. Um, one, mentorship. So finding uh, peer mentorships, you know, being a CEO is one of the loneliest gigs. It's it's all on your shoulders. It's even hard even to talk to your co-founder. I know it is with me. A lot of it just is all my shoulders, things I don't share with anybody. It's, it's lonely. So I would find peer groups with other CEOs, uh, mentors that um, have been there, done that, that can help coach you. For me, at the lowest points in my life, I go to the books. And I, I love the movie Good Will Hunting. He got a Harvard education at the public library, so the movie goes. So I started, I educated myself on finances, just uh, started a book club um, and uh, for only women, and we read financial books, and it was horrible. They were so terrible. But I learned so much. I bought my first house two years after reading books. Two years after reading financial books. Um, it changed my world around. I realized that I had a bad relationship with money and it was because I just felt uncomfortable. And so I had to suck it up and I read and I read and I read and I rewarded myself with wine afterwards and chocolate. <laughs> and, and I had other girls kind of depending on me reading, reading these books because we were all reading them together. So that, I, it, you know, when I got stuck in sales, I went to chapters and I picked up sales books, a podcast, and you educate yourself and you're going to build confidence because a little bit of self-doubt is, I don't know if I know this, or I've only, never done it before. Um, and uh, I had a I had a fourth one, and I don't know, oh, gold boards, big fan of gold boards. My husband not so much because it's in our bedroom a lot and they're everywhere. <laughs> but I, you know, I do believe if you don't know where you're going, you're going to be you're going to drift. Know where you're going, figure out the steps to get there. Mentorships like like stack the odds in your favor. Um, and if you're struggling and you're really having self doubt, again go through that systematically and find the resources you need to get to that next step. And one, one thing to add is that we need to get over, it's okay to fail. And so thinking about if like a lot of times imposter syndrome and things like that, we're afraid to fail. So taking that risk and these are like, great resources, having mentors or going out to different support groups, also talking to your friends, but um, just taking that risk and being saying whatever and being okay with it and saying it's, it's okay to fail, you can iterate from there, you'll figure out and just make changes because you'll learn from that mistake. And that's the biggest piece is it's okay to fail if you're learning from it. And I think a lot of CEOs, we're high performers and we're competitive and we, um, it is, it's hard to fail because we're so like, you know, it's really, really hard to fail. But the best things that have ever happened to me have been when my face has hit the dirt, honestly. I have learned so much from a failure, more than I ever would from my successes. And I'm so grateful for, for those opportunities to crash and burn and cry, because I've learned. Yeah, and you will be the fine failure. Like for me, I always see this as like, you are going, you know, for the summit and in your journey, make sure you enjoy it. Because yes, you'll be tired, you need to stop, you know, take a deep breath. Make sure you enjoy the view. This has been very helpful because yes, you will have so many difficult days, but every time I remember my name, it's just a matter of time, <laughs> come on. You know, you promise yourself you'll enjoy this journey. And this is what I even like tell my team. Sometimes I see like they're stressed out, or, like the panic, I was like, don't worry guys, we, we won't hit the wall. This is, one investor told me you will hit the wall. <laughs> and I will keep telling myself, of course you won't hit the wall. So this is actually again, 
um, is not in our team. So you want to evolve because you know where you are going. It's just a matter of this journey, right? And you'll enjoy that journey. Of course, those are the you know, ups and downs that make it joyful to succeed. All right. Um, yes, the struggle is real. Um, I, I think we, sorry, I think we should wrap it up right now. Well, you can, you can, while well, we can, we, you can um, continue the conversation. Ali, you st you're still going to be here around for oh, a yeah. couple of minutes. Ali, do you want to uh, say, um, wrap it up, a couple last words? Um, <laughs> just on, off the fly, um, but it was amazing to be here tonight, and I think uh, we learned a lot from these founders. Um, my, my background is as an entrepreneur is a social entrepreneur, so it's a totally different beast. And a big thing that we need to take away is that confidence piece. And these two women are extraordinarily confident, which is amazing and what, what we need to see and look for that big vision. And don't be afraid to take risks. It's okay to fail and learn from it. And you'll get back up and we're all here also if you have any questions or there's it's a very supportive community here in vancouver which i i have loved to be a part of coming from toronto it's a, it's a different beast and yeah we're always here to answer any questions that you have all right yes do you have a few last words Oh, I was just going to say, guys, if anybody has any questions or needs support or whatever, reach out to me, Bernadette at storytap.com. I've been there. I would love to help. Um, if you just, you know, we're all busy. We're all time starved, but we all have to help each other, and I'm in. So, like, feel free. Yeah, same here. Uh, I, I just want to add one more thing. You always hear about success stories because we won't go to internet and write about the things that may actually be taking us failure. So don't worry if you just see all like positives, oh, we had financing, we rejected. It is not the real life of me as an entrepreneur. If you go to my Instagram, you'll see I'm running half marathon, I'm traveling, like, but it's not real me. It's like the way, honestly, because no one is asking you, when you cried, why you cried, what was the problem, you know? When, when it didn't work. So just want to give you, you know, this hint. This is what I noticed recently because one of my friends told me, oh my, you're always traveling and oh, you've been to Australia two times, like in five months. I was like, yeah, and I have never seen a kangaroo no koala yet. <laughs> so, which means, but I know all Uber drivers, honestly. I'm like, I work in my Uber, you know, rides and so yeah, that is the, that is the truth. We all have our own story. We have all difficult days and good days and things to talk about, but at the end, it is just your hard work and motivation and seeing your vision very clearly where you are going. Just remember that. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, well said. And also the people you meet, right? So yeah, please, uh, please. Uh, I hope you met some great people here tonight and made some new friends. And I encourage you to keep the conversation going and, and, and share your passions and ideas uh, or your problems and struggles. Thank you so much, Ali, Mariam, and Bernadette. Another big round of applause, please. Um, I have a little, little something for you. Um, small appreciation. For your time. Special, special olive oil for some special people. Oh, sorry. And uh, it's Mother Day too, so you can give the flower to your mothers, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. I really appreciated that. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming. Um, and I also just wanted to say thank you to my team uh, and people helping out. Henry at the back over there. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Axel. And thank you, Bernadette. And thank you, Jan. And now please uh, finish the wine uh, and the food and keep the conversation going.